Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, our guest is Chuck Kelly with Nautel. He's got some great ideas about a future of all digital radio and digital ham radio as well. That's coming up, plus a great lesson in how to think about problems. It's all coming up on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store, with outstanding service, saving, and support, online at bgs.cc. By the new Ruby console from Lavo. See Lavo in your future at lavo.com slash twert. And by the Telos Alliance, shaping the future of audio, inspiring you to create the most exciting and engaging audio experiences imaginable. Visit telosalliance.com slash opt-in. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here. And for me, this time here, I'm back in Hawaii, uh, back at uh, Star 94.3. It's the studios here behind me of uh, KHKU, which is a kind of Hawaiian. It's for a haku, which means star in the Hawaiian language. So we're Star 94.3. That's where I'm coming to you today from. We're almost done with the studio. Transmitter side is next. And uh, in, fact, <laughs> in fact, we're putting in a, a, a Nautel transmitter. We'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. Uh, Chris Tobin couldn't be with us today. He's at a transmitter site. Uh, he is elbows over armpits, apparently, in a transmitter this afternoon. So let's go ahead and just bring in our guest. It's Chuck Kelly from Nautel. Chuck, welcome in. Glad to have you back. Thank you, Kirk. And let me be the first to uh, congratulate you on show number 399. That's a wonderful thing. This is a this is quite a benefit you bring the broadcast industry. So congratulations. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm having a blast doing it. I get great help from Chris Tobin and uh, also from uh, Suncast, our producer. Also, lately, mm -hmm. I've been getting some help from a friend that you and I both know, and that's Denny Sanders. Uh, Denny has sure. been doing a lot of my, my booking uh, of guests, and he's gotten some terrific guests on. So I'm just grateful for all the help that we have, and including you being on the show on short notice. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> so when we talk with uh, Chuck Kelly, there's just no telling what we're going to find out. Anything from, uh, let's see, uh, rocket propulsion uh, to foreign stars <laughs> or or what's next in digital radio. So we're going to hear about some of those things. I do want to mention that our show uh, is brought to you by some great sponsors, the folks at Lavo. You go to the website, Lavo, L-A-W-O, Lavo.com slash twerk. It'll take you right to their page where uh, they've got uh, all their radio stuff. Uh, also brought to you in part by my friends at Omnia and the Omnia Volt, the amazing little one rack unit processor that sounds just terrific. And also brought to you by a brand new product from Henry Engineering. We'll tell you about it later in the show called the Sportscaster. And oh my goodness, it is the answer to prayer for so many people who do sports remotes. So you'll want to uh, look at this thing and get your hands on one before the sports season uh, this fall uh, gets on us because it's just amazing. We'll tell you about that. It's it's uh, uh, being sponsored by the folks at Broadcasters General Store, which is, of course, where you can get Henry Engineering products. All right. Uh, we're just going to get right started right into our show. We'll take our first commercial break in a few minutes. Chuck, why don't you just give us a little preview of some of the things that you'd like to talk about or just jump right into the, the, the first topic we had. And I, I think you had something about digital radio to talk about. Yeah, I, I thought it might be kind of interesting to talk about digital radio. You know, digital radio in the United States is uh, pretty well understood. Um, HD radio is very, very successful. And, and most people may be surprised to know that digital radio, most of the world envies the position that the United States is in relative to really? digital radio. Because we've we've made a decision. We've done it, and the radios are there. There's 50 million HD radios in the marketplace, and 5 million more or so are coming out, out of the lines every year. So the wow. world envies um, our choice of digital radio. Um, but there are other systems, and, and they're also on the air around the world. There's digital audio broadcasting and digital radio mondial. And uh, mm -hmm. those systems also uh, have their adherence around the world. And I thought it might be kind of interesting just to look at it from the perspective of a country. You know, what would you do if you were the head of the FCC of some country that hasn't made a decision on digital radio? What kind of things would you think about? Uh, what kind of concerns would you have? Where would you go to try to figure out the answers? And I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, subject. So if you're if you're up toward it, I'll I'll go into that. We're going to go into that in just a, in just a minute. And I'm I'm glad you mentioned wow, 50 million cars with HD radios. I had no idea it was yeah. that high. Now I, I guess the the question that I would have is how many 
uh, car owners know that they have HD radio in their car. Because I remember back in the AM stereo days, I would get in people's cars and I would say, hey, you've got AM stereo. Huh? What's that? They would have no idea what this was. What do you think the yeah. consumer uptake is versus the uh, The cool the thing car about uptake? it is, the cool thing is HD radios basically work if you have an HD radio signal to tune into. And it just automatic. you don't have to enable it or turn it on. They're built in default to, to decode the HD radio signal and take over the signal from the analog. So it may be that the person doesn't know, and it doesn't, may not make a whole lot of difference. He may just notice the additional subchannels, et cetera, and the better audio quality. Ah, okay. All right. All right. Um, and I certainly noticed that HD radio in the U.S. seems to have reached into some medium and smaller markets where it wasn't there before because of the issue of being able to feed translators with an HD signal. That's the legal yep. way uh, or one legal way to feed a, a translator off the air, right? That's right. That's right. And, and what's yeah. really fascinating to me is in some markets around the world, or in the, around the United States particularly, um, the population of HD radio receivers as a percentage of the total in car radios is nearing 50%. So it is not too soon to start thinking about the future and what do we do when we're able to turn off the analog. Ah, that's going to be a subject for coming up in the, in the next few minutes. Uh, you've tuned yep. into This Week in Radio Tech. Maybe you've stumbled across it. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. And I, by the way, I do work for the Telos Alliance. And so uh, I certainly have some knowledge along the lines of their products and, uh, and you know, some, some, some biases into the technologies that uh, we're forging ahead with there. Uh, Chuck Kelly is our guest. Uh, he is with the, the Nautel company and they make as you know uh transmitters uh, am and fm and in fact there's one not far from me here it's still in the box it's just about 30 feet away from me and in a, in a few days it's going to go up onto a big old mountain uh, by helicopter it's going to take a helicopter ride to a mountain here on the island of Kauai. i wish i could do that myself but we have a local engineer who knows the territory and he's going to take care of that so we're going to take a, a quick uh time out uh for our sponsor lavo and when we come back, Chuck's going to delve into uh, this topic of turning off the analog FM. I mean, that sounds scary and futuristic, and one country's already done that to some degree. Uh, and what a total digital future looks like, and you know, will it be here sooner than we think? That's coming up after this word from Lavo. There has probably never been a better time in history to buy a new radio mixing console. Today's consoles are more sophisticated than ever, with more features and functions than you can shake a stick at. But, have you noticed how complicated they are? There's a sea of knobs and switches and displays and buttons. Some of them look like you might need a pilot's license to do your show. Well, a board doesn't have to be complicated to be powerful. Just look at the new Ruby mixing surface from Lavo. The first thing you notice is how smooth and streamlined it is. Ruby has lots of cool tech, but what it doesn't have is that confusing ocean of buttons that clutter things up. Now, we all know that there are some console features that Jock only uses once in a while, so why dedicate controls to them? Ruby fixes this problem by moving those once-in-a-blue-moon controls to a touch-sensitive, customizable GUI that happily shares screen space with your other studio software, helping you fight control room clutter. Thanks to this design innovation, talent that use Ruby produce smoother shows with less errors. Controls that are used the most fall naturally to hand, while functions that rarely need adjustment are easily controlled with just a couple of clicks in the context-sensitive GUI. And Ruby has cool features you won't find on other boards, like AutoMix, an intelligent gain writing function that guarantees the perfect mix for multi-mic morning shows and call-in segments dual-mode snapshots that instantly switch the motorized faders between on-air and production modes, and enough DSP and I.O. options to make even your pro sound pals green with envy. And because quality is as important to Lavo as it is to you, every console is proudly built to fanatically precise standards at Lavo's own factory in Germany. If you're ready to declutter your control room, do yourself a favor. Check out the new Ruby and the other cool Lavo Radio Tech at www.lawo.com slash twert. In Radio Tech, it's companies like Lavo that make our broadcast possible and make it possible for us to bring uh, this to you and to pay our bills and uh, to pay our huge talent fees. Isn't that right, Chuck? That's right. I want to double my salary. <laughs> okay, I'll, no problem. I'll double it. Uh, 
So, uh, Chuck, you were starting to go in uh, on, on the digital radio topic and turning off FM. Now, I heard a story a year, year and a half ago about, was it Sweden turning off some analog FM? Do you know how that has gone? Mm-hmm. My understanding, not not so well. Um, it was a political decision, as I understand it. And uh, my understanding is that some of the stations um, uh, are complaining that their listeners are, are listening to border broadcasters from adjacent countries that are still operating in FM because the population of receivers is not sufficient to support DAB, which was the technology they were moving to. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay, so, so uh, but it, but nonetheless, you're talking about a future where we don't have FM analog, where it's all yeah. digital. And in fact, it seems like a couple of years ago at NAB, uh, Nautel demonstrated some technology with a whole lot of uh, HD carriers in in one space. This is one way getting to, way to, ahead to, of me, Kirk. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you go. You go ahead. You, I, I just back on square first. One. I I, I kind of wanted to lay the groundwork and 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 you know yeah. put you in charge of a mythical country that hasn't made a decision on digital radio and just for a moment talk about the kinds of considerations that you ought to be thinking about and 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 how it plays against those three digital radio systems. I mean, um, you know, you got to look at backwards compatibility. You got to look at the millions potentially of receivers that you have in the market that only receive analog AM and FM. So how much backwards compatibility is there? How available are frequencies? Is the entire band taken up? Uh, or is there lots of empty space on the band? Are the AM and FM stations successful in making profit? Um, uh, you know, Because if you decide to shut one of them off and, and go to all digital, what's the impact of that on the, on the bottom line for the stations? Those short and long-term costs of conversion, not only for the station themselves, but also for the consumers. Uh, how much money does it cost to buy enough uh, receivers of digital type so that uh, so that the country has a reasonable penetration of receivers? And uh, and then the receiver availability, in, just in general, and the cost of that receiver. Um, you know, AM and FM have pretty good building penetration, and and the receivers are are low cost both for receive and transmit. Um, on the other hand, you know, one of the, one of the technologies out there that a lot of countries have adopted, including that country in Scandinavia that you were mentioning, as well as Australia and the UK, um, uh, use digital audio broadcasting, which is a OFDM system, which, which, uh, uses a new band. It's, it's not within the existing AM and FM bands. Uh, so it's a new band and it has a multiplex. So it has multiple stations on a single transmitter. Um, but just for a second, suppose you're the in, the owner of a station, an FM station, for that matter, in in a in a small town in the in the community that is uh, going to go to DAB. Um, so the, the if if DAB comes to town, of course you've got to buy a spot in the multiplex. It's going to raise your transmission costs for a period of time. But in addition to that, uh, you're going to have to keep your FM going for quite some period of time while the receivers get out there. Um, but the real problem is this: that the you know when DAB comes to a market, typically uh, more competitors come to the market, more stations are on the air, and and that and the advertising pie didn't get any bigger, so that means mm. that your slice of the pie actually goes down. So for the user themselves, for the broadcaster themselves, I should say, DAB is a pretty raw deal. Your costs go up. And your revenue goes down. And it stays that way for quite some period of time. So Nautel has not supported DAB for that exact reason. Uh, In-band technologies are better for one reason, that the the, the number of stations is already defined. Uh, We can add new content channels without adding new advertisers, without adding new Uh licensees. And and this is actually better for for the stations. Another thing you got to think about when you're um, working in a, uh, in a in a government FCC type of organization is, if you're in region uh, the IR uh, IRU um, ITU rather region one or three, your country uses nine kilohertz steps on AM, and the only region right. is the Americas, which is region two that uses ten kilohertz. You've got to have a digital radio system that fits within that space, and not all do. And uh, some only work in one of them. And some receivers are only working for one of them. So these are important things to think about. Uh, DRM tends to be very good. Digital Radio Mondial tends to be very good at working within the 9 kilohertz steps. 
but HD radio, not so much. Um, so these are things to be considered. Um, the other thing, and this is what you were talking about a little bit, um, about where, where we as American broadcast engineers perceive digital radio. In fact, HD radio as it's currently utilized around the United States um, as a hybrid system where you have both the analog and the digital on the transmitter at the same time is only a stop on the highway. It's only a step on the way towards an all-digital future. And, and eventually, as the receiver penetration gets to a high enough percentage, we're going to start thinking about turning off the FM or, or the analog in an FM signal. Now, there have been some efforts on the part of Ubiquity, who came up with the standard, to uh, promote a standard for all digital FM. Um, but as I understand it, it hasn't been implemented in the receiver chipsets or the transmitter uh, software. So as a result, um, it might have meant that there was a complete restart of the entire process and, and back to the chicken and egg problem again, which would be a major headache. Um, however, as you pointed out, Nautel has done some development. Our Philip Schmidt has done some incredible work on something called HD multiplex. And in that, yeah. he figured out a way to use the standard technology, use the existing receivers that are already in the market, turn off the FM, analog signal and get up to 15 stations on a single transmitter. Now, not necessarily in exactly the same bandwidth, it's a little larger, but 15 stations on a single frequency. And we have demoed, uh, demonstrated this live on the air at KKLZ in, in a Beasley station in Las Vegas during last NAB. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing technology. It means that you can end up with you know, a couple of dis different scenarios that work. One is, suppose you've got a small market station. I know, Kirk, you and I both grew up in small market radio. Um, suppose you're a small market station, you know, thir town of 30,000 or something like that, and you've got five or six or seven or ten radio stations in the community, and none of them are making a dime. Because the costs of, of running those stations all told up don't don't quite don't total up and, and make enough money I don't, in such a small market. One thing yeah. that could happen here is you could actually take and put all of those stations on a single transmitter, on a single stick, and every all the stations, uh, all the, the uh, people in town could listen to not only all those 10 stations, but maybe a few extra formats thrown in by those same licensees. It's up to them. And the rest of the f transmitter facilities could all get sold off. Their locations could be sold off. There's a lot of money to be made there, that more than pay for the conversion cost of the technology. So that's one scenario that could work. The other thing that could work is in major markets, you could actually have hundreds of content channels in the FM band. Now, why would you want that? Well, we're, con we're now competing with so many different formats um, on the web, on satellite, on so many different formats. And radio doesn't have the, the bandwidth for so many of those formats. But with this technology, it is possible to do that. And, it, and it, the transmission costs actually go down. The transmission costs of each station individually goes down and even as a total goes down. So there's some huge opportunities here. Nautel isn't the ones who who know how to commercialize this or how to know how to make money on it or know how to format the stations. But we've come up with some technology that I think people could think about and maybe come up with a way to help radio transition into the future. Um, just as we have, we've radio has metamorphized itself dozens of times over its history. Um, I remember the naysayers saying that when television came out, radio was going to be gone. But um, <laughs> radio reinvented itself and, and grew. And I think it's going to do it again. I still have a question about, um, about the amount of penetration of a technology. And, of course, we're talking about digital uh, radio technology yeah. uh, versus the receivers. And, and, I want, and, I, and maybe it's not a, a real comparison, but let's think about the penetration of cable television. Now, I know now we've got uh, uh, over-the-air digital television and, and with cable television prices being so high, a lot of people have cut the cord or they're just right. using uh, their cable provider as their internet provider. And, and that's what I'm doing. I'm not getting any cable channels at my house. But um, so at one point, though, I, I want to say that uh, 
cable penetration in a lot of towns was on the order of 85, 87, 89 percent of the households. That's pretty high. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and certainly in, in, in the low 80s in, in towns where I've asked about it. And yet television broadcasters have never thought about turning their transmitters off, although that's kind of changed here just lately uh, with uh, with uh, you know, H, other uh, other TV signals, uh, you know, sub channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, with the repack. Uh, but at, at what point in digital radio penetration into cars and homes can uh, a can a, a broadcasters say you know what it's getting it's just not worth it to keep this fm analog technology going anymore we're willing to take the hit on the maybe 11 12 15% of people who we can't hit anymore until they buy radios we're willing to take mm -hmm. that hit and be all digital and go with the benefits uh, there too like lower cost I think there's a couple of aspects to that question. First is if you if you take it right at face value, I think you're right. You got to be north of 85 or 90 percent. On the other hand, if in it, in making that move, you're able to create enough additional, unique, compelling content channels, it might be enough to get that 10 or 15 percent of the state people out there to motivate them to go out and get receivers to do just that. Um, and, and, and relatively quickly turn things around, um, and, and, and get a hundred percent penetration or close to it. Uh, one of the things that I find is absolutely fascinating. And, you know, we talk about cable, a lot of people are talking about cell phones as being the replacement for radio. Um, you know, you and I, Kirk, are old radio hands and I, I don't myself believe that, that, uh, the cell phone companies are, are going to be a reasonable replacement for radio. Uh, or streaming. And, and uh, I think that there's a cost effectiveness and there is an immediacy that comes out of free over the air radio. And, and I don't see that changing in any time in the, in the near future. So uh, we might uh, diverge a bit there. I've noticed that um, I, I brought a radio with me to Hawaii here. And frankly, I've had it on twice just to make sure it works and it scans the band. Uh, whenever we're hanging around our condo that we're renting here, uh, where you, we, we brought in an, an echo dot with us. I stole it out of my son's bedroom, packed it in the suitcase. And I listened to my own radio stations back in Mississippi or, or our station in Samoa with the, uh, with the echo dot. And I, I find that I'm definitely part of those consumers who are listening to radio with, uh, an, an echo type device or a Google home device. And I'm spending a, a lot of time also uh, with the phone listening to, uh, to, to YouTube videos. Uh, some are rebroadcasts of radio shows. You know, they, they've been podcastified. Uh, but others are things that are just, just for the web. But anyway, um, now, of course, I, I, I don't have HD radio in either of my cars. I have two older cars and don't have that. So I, I, I guess I'm missing out on, on that experience. I, and, and, unless and I don't propagation know what it's like. was, yeah. and unless yeah. propagation was something truly, truly amazing. You're never going to hear your stations back home or in American Samoa from where you are. So you're a neat, unique True. case. True. The key is I, I am. if you're driving, yeah. if you're driving down the road in your rental car and you want to hear what's going on on the Island of Hawaii, where you are right now, and you want to find out if there's a storm coming in, you're not going to get there reliably with streaming or anything else. It's, it's radio. That's going to get the job done. Yeah. I wonder how 5G technology is going to change that. Because every time there's a new G technology, we're told about you know, how fast, uh, the, the, how big the bandwidth. You'll be able to download a whole movie in seven seconds, you know, with whatever it may be. And yeah. honestly, in most of the places where I go, I have enough bandwidth to stream YouTube video mobile, mobile-ly. Um, right. that doesn't always make it the best choice hey, sometimes I get in the car and I just want to hear my buddy, Phil Valentine doing the Phil Valentine show in Nashville. Sometimes I just want to tune in and hear, uh, Michael Del Giorno back again, back in Nashville doing a, a talk show. So yeah, there are things that I will tune in to the radio for. It's still the most convenient device in the car. What do you think would happen, Kirk, if if radio were supplanted by cell phone technology? If if all of the radio stations decided to pack it in, and um, the cell phone companies started being the purveyor of all content, do you think that the the type of plan that you've got right now, where you 
you don't really pay for bits. You pay for one package and that's it. That plan would still be there or because the competition from free over the air radio was gone, you think maybe they might start taking advantage of that and we'd start paying for all of our broadcasting. That's a good question, and I'm sure that it would ebb and flow a lot. You know, just like, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a rabid uh, T-Mobile fanboy, but you know, when when they seem to have truly unlimited streaming first, uh, and I, I've and I've experienced that. I, I think I've been you know cut short a couple of days at the end of a month after I passed the 50 gig mark uh, on my phone. Um, and and will and future technologies will that allow you know more without you know, without increasing the cost to to those carriers I, I i don't know what i do what i do fear about the phone or the dashboard in new cars is radio no longer has a platform that is ah uh, it's just it's just radio you know you're competing now with all these other buttons that are on that dashboard now my two older cars uh, and even our rental car that we have here you know, it's got a radio uh it, it it does switch to ipod mode if you plug the phone into it but uh it's a radio, and that's the one thing, you, and it's simple and easy to use. And I fear that's the one thing I fear losing is that simplicity and that special platform right in front of your face uh, in, in a car. Where in the future we There's might another have to do with all these other things. Yeah. There's another thing that we potentially could lose, and that is the emergency preparedness angle of radio. You know, I've been around the world enough places, and I've seen dis natural disasters, whether they be earthquakes or hurricanes or typhoons, as they call it in some places, whatever. I, I've seen all – the very first thing that quits is all the cell phone networks. Um, and, you know, the only thing that works, the very first thing that gets the word out about – public disaster and the, the, the information from the government to people about how to take care of themselves, how to save lives is radio. And that's, that's, that's something that is very important. Free over the air radio is something that uh, is, is, is treasured among people who have been through a natural disaster. True. True. That's a, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, Tell you what, we're going to uh, take a quick break here and hear from my friends at, at Omnia and the Omnia Volt. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue this discussion about going all digital and the pluses and minuses and where we think we have to go to get there. And 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 still ask the question: Should we ever? Uh, and and I know there are plenty among us who would say no. Just keep the keep the you know FM is simple and it works. Keep it going. Uh, why why would you change right. that? Uh, for example, if they came out with a digital toilet, would you switch to it just because it was digital? You know, no, the the old flush toilet works pretty well. So you know, we'll the, the digital flash. Test. There's a digital flashlight that yep. has three buttons: on, off, and reset. Oh gosh, <laughs> I do like my LED flashlights though. The batteries seem to last a long time. Yeah. Hey, we'll be back right after this with Chuck Kelly on this week in radio tech. Stand by. More top radio stations choose Omnia than all other competing processors combined. Now, meet the Omnia Volt, sharing lineage with Omnia processors like the Omnia 11, electrifying competitive market-leading audio in a compact one-rack unit package. With Omnia Heritage built in, the Omnia Volt includes Dynamics Magic from Omnia Chief Algorithm Designer Cornelius Gould, including six AGC sections from start to finish, deep bass, warmth, and stereo enhancers, five-band time-aligned limiter, the world's best presets to get you started right, and spectrally pristine final processing designed by Frank Foti. Omnia Volt users love its quick tweak feature. Quick tweak distills years of processing knowledge and proven approaches into simple controls that turn you into a processing pro. Nail your signature sound in minutes using advanced presets or your own settings right from the Volt's front panel or a PC. Omnia Volt brings charisma to your station's audio. FM translators and low-power FM stand out among the crowd. AM stations maximize clarity and coverage. Digital broadcasts sound clear and musical without fatiguing artifacts. Smart design, clearly visible outside and inside. Input and output connections in analog, AES-3, live wire, and multiplex for FM. Automatic input selection handles redundant STLs. Remote control works with today's browsers, tablets, and smartphones. Idealized patch point for external watermarking. And hardened construction to withstand lightning strikes, surges, high RF fields, and harsh conditions. The new Omnia Volt is stunning. Everyone will know you've got an Omnia on your station. 
Omnia Volt is versatile too. DSP Core Firmware alters the personality of Volt to fit your changing needs. FM, AM, digital transmission, or studio processing. Volt can even be used as a standalone stereo generator. DSP cores aren't extra cost add-ons. Download the functionality you need for free. The Omnia Volt. Omnia audio processing for any station and a smart upgrade for aspiring broadcasters. Proven audio processing that'll leave your competitors in the dust. I just met with a bunch of uh, broadcasters and uh, and Omnia dealers a couple weeks ago in uh, in Europe. And the comment that we heard from a number of them was, that, you know what? This Omnia Volt is actually better than the Omnia 6. And you know how popular the Omnia 6 was for years and years. I mean, it was the top of the line. And, uh, hey, the Omnia Volt costs well under half of what an Omnia 6 costs, almost a third of what an Omnia 6 costs. So check it out, the Omnia Volt. You want to crank up your station, make it so clean and clear. And that quick tweak feature is really amazing. It lets you easily dial in the settings you want. A lot of thinking behind that quick tweak feature. Omnia Volt, available from your favorite Omnia dealer. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack along with Chuck Kelly of Nautel on uh, This Week in Radio Tech, episode 399. And I want to, I want to, uh, give you a little reason to keep watching or keep listening because at the end of the show, the very last thing in the show, Chuck Kelly is going to have something that I think you would refer to as uh, a bit of, I'm going to call it a bit of epistemology. I think that's the right word. Is that the right word I'm looking for? Thinking about thinking, separating belief yeah, and fact. Yeah, something like that. Yep. It's an old yeah. editorial I wrote in 1994 and it's called Cat Skinning. <laughs> Cat skinning. All right. That's going to be at the end of the show to keep you, our listeners and viewers, uh, held on through the end of the show. You know, or, yes, I know you can just fast forward to it uh, unless you're watching live. Uh, and we do appreciate, by the way, whether you're watching live or uh, downloading the show uh, or watching on YouTube or, or somewhere else. Uh, thanks for watching. Tell your friends about it, please. But uh, this is really cool what Chuck has for us. You know, one of the things I've always appreciated about it, Chuck is Chuck is uh, uh, Chuck's the kind of guy that likes to examine why we think about things the way we do. And that's a good way to truly understand a, a subject from all, all angles, all the way around. So uh, that's one of the things I, I, I like about Chuck's thinking. Uh, so, Chuck, uh, where were we in our discussion of, of HD or of, of, of digital technology? Well, and, and I think we pretty much wrapped it up. I, you know, I, I, I didn't want to say that, um, that, that, that digital, all digital radio in any particular form was in our immediate future. I wasn't suggesting anybody seriously consider shutting off their analog today. Just that as we're getting to pretty reasonable receiver penetrations in the United States, it's not too early to start thinking about such things. Um, and as time goes by, it may very well be that there's going to be uh, more on, uh, you know, fully digital stations coming. And it's going to provide a myriad of benefits that people can't conceive of today. So something to think about. The other thing I was going to bring up. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, back in the mid '80s, in, in the mid '80s, yep. I uh, I got to tour several cable head ends. We had a, I worked at a radio station that was right next door to a cable head end. We had a good technical relationship with them. We we used their tower for some things, and it was great. Yep. And that's where I learned that their cable penetration was about eighty five percent back in the mid '80s. And I thought, mm -hmm. well. Gee, if it gets much higher, why would a TV station at the time they were, you know, analog TV transmission, why would they need to continue to put a million or more watts out of their tower? It's got to cost some money. Why not just go all cable if penetration's that high? Now, we, that was an unusual situation. That town happened to have very good cable penetration. And I thought someday, someday TV stations are going to be able to turn that transmitter off. And, and I got to believe that e that today with all the streaming and all the video, and I get my local stations and my cable type stations that I want. I happen to, to choose um, YouTube TV as, as my supplier of that 35 bucks a month. I know there's sling and there's other products out there to get your local stations and other things, you know, over the top television. But I, I got to believe that there's, there's still, well, politically, I, I think if you're a TV station, you don't want to turn that thing off. That means turning your license in and the well, license the is must valuable. Carry, the must carry rules right. are, are the reason exactly. people do that. I mean, if, if you don't have must carry, then the cable company can just choose among whatever they can get the cheapest and put it on the air. And there's, there's nothing, um, uh, keeping them from doing that. Uh, but must carry rules kind of make, 
uh, provide the the over the air broadcasters that have been doing this for so long and and our local um, uh, give them uh, an advantage. Yeah, exactly. So I I don't know that they're gonna turn you know why would they turn that off when it's necessary to keep to the must carry? But you got to believe at some point. I don't know. At some point, maybe the must carry goes away and people just, I mean, when I watch local television, I watch my local stations. They have local news and local weather, uh, local sports. Uh, I can't get that from CNN or Fox News. Uh, I can't get That's that right. from from uh, the Discovery Channel. I lots of other things, but you know, not the things I'm interested in at that moment. Anyway, yep. uh, so the same thing for, for radio. When, when, do, when does streaming and digital have enough penetration to where the analogs can get turned off? It's a different question, though, because we're still getting the same content. We're still having the same advertisers. We're still using the same same station license, even if we yeah. switch to uh, all digital on, uh, on on AM or FM radio. Yeah. So, different deal. All right. What's your What's your next topic? Where do you want to head from this point? Well, you know, it's not too far uh, of a divergence to 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 move from digital radio in the commercial broadcasting realm to something that you and I are both very interested in, and that's amateur radio. Uh, many of us as broadcast engineers are also hams, and I just thought it might be interesting to talk about one of the revolutions that's really happened yeah, in amateur radio, and it's and this month is the one year anniversary of a new format, a new uh, transmission technology called FT8, and I thought it might be kind of fun to talk about that for a second. Yeah, so I, you know, I've never been into these digital technologies on ham radio. Most of what I've done is just IRLP, uh, echo mm-hmm. length, you know, that kind of thing. I enjoy talking to people yeah. uh, in Australia as they're waking up or, or they're going to bed because I'm doing the opposite thing. You know, that's kind of cool. Sure. But that's pretty pretty much the extent of my experience. But I, you know, we had Charlie Wooten on the show uh, a, a few weeks ago, and he was talking mm-hmm. about uh, this same digital mode. And, and what kills me is. You know, I'm used to seeing a spectrum analyzer display and being able to see something there. And I think that this, these digital modes now, there's almost nothing, like it's buried in the noise and that you can still pick out what's what's being and, and And the display That's that true. we look at when we're running FT8 is, is a spectrum wow. analyzer display. That's how we see this. But instead of the whole width of the spectrum analyzer being, you know, the 10 megahertz bandwidth or something like that, like in the FM band or something, it's, you know, each signal in, in FT8 is 50 hertz wide, just 50 hertz. Wow. And the spectrum that we're looking at is an audio spectrum, say up to 3,000 hertz or something. So your one frequency in a sideband transceiver comes to audio, goes into a sound card on your PC, and all the magic happens there. And it's 50 hertz wide a, and over, that is, a, the, the, the length of every transmission, whether you're receiving or transmitting it, takes 15 seconds. And you can have a QSO in about a minute or a minute and a half. And, and as a result, it has become one of the most popular modes ever in radio. Um, I saw a stat the other day that said there was actually more FT8 QSOs going on in the ham bands than all of the other modes combined. Now, I don't know if that's accurate, but it it you you couldn't you can prove it by what it what it looks like online. You can see how many stations are on. I've I've been working, you know, it's one year since Joe Taylor and Steve Frankie uh, developed this system and opened it up for everybody and 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 provided the software WSJTX. And I, I I got on it right away just for fun. I run 25 watts here at my home. I'm a, I'm a, I've got three licenses. I'm W9MDO. I'm VE1MDO. And just last week, I became 4ECHO1MDO. So I'm very proud of sitting down and taking the exam for that in the Philippines. But um, anyway, um, I have worked now. Four bands worked all states plus DXCC on 25 watts just in FT8 mode. And this is a, a mode that's only been in existence for one year. So I find that really revolutionary. And the thing that's really cool about it, um, Kirk, and I think you'll appreciate this. You remember back into college and when they were talking about information theory, information theory basically said 
the more you narrow the bandwidth of the transmitted signal, the better your signal to noise is going to be for the same conditions of power and noise in the channel and all that sort of thing. So when you go to 50 hertz of bandwidth, extraordinary things can happen. You can pick up signals, as you said, you know, 20 20 or more dB below the noise floor and and get perfect copy. Um, this is fascinating. It's just it, it's you know you're right. You can you can look and not see anything there, and still be re- printing what the guy is saying and and he's hearing you, and you're doing it with 20 watts or something. It's 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 amazing. And what it makes possible is probably something that you're dealing with. Because I know you don't have a bunch of antennas up in your place. You probably have uh, restrictions and covenants and things like that you have to deal with. This turns poor antennas into worldwide antennas. This makes cool stuff happen because you get this advantage of digital signal-to-noise ratio advantage because of information theory. You know, Bob, I want to make sure and I want to promote before we quit this topic, and we're going to talk about a couple of okay. things aspects of it. Uh, I'd like to hear some practical advice on what a person needs, at least just to listen. So if you want to listen to this, you know, what, what computer sure. program do you need sound card, you know, and basic shortwave receiver to, to hear this, this kind of stuff. And then of course you can tell us what you need to transmit and participate in this, assuming you're already an amateur radio operator, or you want to get that license. But I'm, I'm, yep. uh, does this, this, uh, FT8 technology, does this have anything is, is, is spread spectrum involved in this either in the RF or the audio domains? No, no, nope, not at all. Um, and this is this is a, a a a an eight FSK system. So there's eight carriers that are either on or off, and um, and it and it's very slow, um, and that's a lot. And it allows it to fit into a, a 50 hertz bandwidth, um, and it has uh, I forget the number of 200 or something characters transmitted in a, certain, in a single 15 seconds, but plus the error correction stuff that's got a, that another 20 percent or so overhead on top of that. Um, but that makes it very robust and allows you to to have transmissions around the world. Let me carry it just a step further. There's another companion technology that's available in the same software. And I'll get to your question about um, uh, what do you need to make this happen. But there's another companion technology called WSPR. WSPR is weak signal propagation reporting. This is a beaconing system. And it's even lower power. Most people run 5 watts or less. Its bandwidth is 6 hertz. And a single transmission, a single beacon, takes 2 minutes and these things are being broadcast from all over the world, and you can get online and listen or see real time where people, what paths are working on what frequency bands. Now, let me carry it to an extreme just for a second and, and, and pique your interest. You're familiar with the Raspberry Pi, I'm sure. Sure. Okay. Well, there's a, there's a GPIO pin in the Raspberry Pi that works on 3.3 volt CMOS logic. Okay, and there's some software out there called Whispery Pi, and it's free, and you download it into the Linux operating system in the Raspberry Pi, and it toggles that GPIO pin at an RF rate and creates a whisper signal, and it ties in for into NTP because you have to be very accurate with your time on these things and your frequency, mm-hmm. and and I I took and created. This was the only ham stuff that I did, or engineering stuff that I did. I created a a four-pole low-pass filter. So I took that 3.3-volt CMOS logic line and put it through a series inductor of parallel capacitor, another series inductor, another parallel capacitor, so as designed to remove the harmonics of what was otherwise a square wave. I then hooked that signal directly up to a 20-meter dipole. That's 14 megahertz. Now, if you calculate out the 3.3-volt CMOS logic, the power that was actually going into the antenna was 10 milliwatts. I was heard, and I I did this in Nova Scotia on a 20-meter dipole hanging from the trees up there. Um, I was heard in Australia with 10 milliwatts on 20 meters. Yeah. So, this is the cool thing about this technology. And, And I... It just makes the hair on my arms stand up, Kirk. It's just so cool that that you could talk to somebody on the other side of the world with ten one thousandths of a watt on a band that you usually need kilowatts to work with. This is so, this is blowing my mind because you, you know yeah. for years 
that in the whole ham radio hobby, we went for mm -hmm. bigger amplifiers and bigger transmitters sure. and, and more sensitive yep. receivers, but and bigger right. antennas and you know uh, uh, friends that have you know, tall and the huge Yagi's and they're pointing them all around the world and even yep. even uh, what are those antennas called when you've got long wires run just above the ground for a long way? Right, right. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yep. Average. I know what Average you mean. Yep. Maybe? Yep. Yeah. That's it. That's right. That's and, right. And, and 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 now we're talking about milliwatts and being able to receive this data. But what's interesting now, and, and we're not in, in this hobby we're in technology development, we're not looking at increasing bandwidth. We're not looking at sending ever faster signals. It seems like nope. this is all about establishing, can I, what's the path like from here to here or here to there or there to there? That's, I, that's can, what can specifically I rack up they're that doing I, with Whisper, yeah. but, yeah. but you can actually yeah. have a two-way automated QSO conversation with somebody yeah. Um, in just a couple of minutes or a minute, and they could be on the other side of the world. As I said, I've, I've got DXCC in less than a year on less than 25 watts. You know, so it's, it's, it's really fascinating technology. And I, I think, um, you know, the, the, the hobby of, of amateur radio has continued to evolve just as dynamically as broadcasting. And, and I, and I think it's cool. I, you know, when I started in, in amateur radio, it was all tubes and, and you tuned for, you know, you dipped the, the, the redness in the, and the plates, um, on your 6146s. But, but this is a different world. And, you know, to get started with something like this, you need a shortwave receiver. It should have some pretty good frequency stability, obviously. You need to have the software running on Linux or, or, or Windows or whatever you want. It's, it's called WSJTX. So you can Google it online and download it for free. Uh, you need to be hooked up to some sort of software that corrects the clock on your computer so that it, you always start and over, if you will, at the exact same time on both ends. But that's it. You know, if you want to just receive, that's all you need. And it and it just works. It's amazing. How does uh, ham radio licensing in the different classes uh, relate to what you can do with FT8? Really doesn't, uh, uh, you know, most anybody who can broadcast, there's, a, there's very specific frequencies in each band for FT8. And as oh. long as your license yeah. allows you to broadcast in that band, Bob's your uncle, as they say, you know, it's, it's no problem. Most everybody, I don't know that novices can do it, but, but pretty much everybody else can do it. Wow. Okay. Now, if, if yeah. I were to take a, a, a decent, um, uh, shortwave receiver, now, where would I find out the frequencies that are in, in use? Built into the FTA. software. When you when you pull down the little oh. window and you pull down the window to 20 meters, it tells you this is the frequency you should see on your receiver. And it has software that automatically talks to the trans. If, if, you, if your transceiver is CAT com compatible, computer-aided tuning, um, then it'll automatically tune it. And it doesn't make any difference about what brand it is. It just works. It's revolutionary okay. stuff. So, so that, and, cool. but that would typically the 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 cat uh, 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 protocol applies typically to transceivers, not not receivers only, right? I think it works for both. I think you can actually control SDRs and things like that with with the cat oh, software yeah. as well. So, okay. SDRs okay, yeah, is another whole subject sure. we could talk about for hours, but uh, it, don't get me started. Well, that be that functionality would be relatively easy to incorporate in, into an SDR. It's all in software anyway, or most of it is. Exactly. Precisely right. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, once again, I'll promote this uh, thing you're going to do after our last break. Stay tuned right. for it. You won't be disappointed. And it's a great exercise in thinking. And I, I just, I, I, I don't know for sure what you're going to do, but I think I know what it is, and it's, it's absolutely worth. Uh, worth listening to. Was there any other topic you wanted to delve into at all Just before we one more uh, thing that I thought with? people might enjoy hearing about I, in, in, you know, we each, we each wear several hats. I, you've got more hats than I know what to do with, but, but I've got a, another hat I wear for the last 25 years or so. I've been the chairman of the international committee for SBE. And I just thought people may not realize the 
way that we handle the international market, um, we handle the rest of the world outside of the United States. As you may know, the Society of Broadcast Engineers is pretty U.S. centric. Um, but we've had a lot of interest in growing our organization. And what we've done is we've actually partnered up with similarly minded organizations, organizations like SBE, but in other countries. So for instance, the following organizations are signed affiliates of SBE, the SET in Brazil, CCBE in Canada, WABE in Canada, the BES in India, Amitra in Mexico, BESPAC in Pakistan, SBETP in the Philippines, COBETA in Korea, SACIA in South Africa, and NDEBU in Uruguay. Now, this affiliation confers no financial relationship. There's no voting relationship in the organizations. We just simple, simply share public documents and interface on matters of mutual infor- importance. And, and Kirk, I know you travel a lot. You must have also noticed as, we, as you've traveled among broadcast engineering circles, languages may be different, cultures may be different, but the problems we face as broadcast engineers are, are more or less the same. And so it's useful to have a worldwide network for the Society of Broadcast Engineers. I am so glad that you brought this up. And, I, and sometimes I forget that you're involved with this, this worldwide uh, association and linking different groups together through SBE. So thanks for that, that reminder. And yes, I'm, I'm, you, you know, I had a conversation with you uh, a few years ago at, S, at uh, an NAB show. And I said, hey, can we get SBE going here and there? He said, Kirk, it, it's already happening. We're, we're already partnered mm-hmm. with a group that they already have there. And, and, and right. sharing, you know, documentation, information, uh, and we're welcome to, to work together. So those yep. lines of, of communication are already open. And it, it continues to grow. Uh, uh, is, is there, if, if, if there are SBE members in the U.S., especially those who might already speak uh, another language, is there anything that they could do to, to be involved with you or your committee uh, or with people, maybe maybe they're from another country and you know people back from their home country sure. or where their parents live or friends. How could people be involved with helping uh, to SBE and in, in helping engineers to share information? Sure, and, and contact me. My, I'm on the SBE website. Um, uh, just uh, let me know, and I would be very happy to involve them. One of the things that I think is going to happen, um, and this may be a, another longer subject, but one of the things that I think may end up happening is, as you know, Kirk, we're we're in a bit of a of a vacuum. Uh, at least it, it's, it appears we're heading that way in broadcast engineering in the United States. You go to the SBE meetings, chapter meetings, and you see nothing but a sea of gray hair. And uh, the 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 age, the average age of broadcast engineers in our industry in the United States is getting older, almost as almost as quickly as time is passing, um, and it's now you know reaching sixty years old or something like that. And and it's not too far in the future where there's going to be uh, a vacuum in terms of the number of broadcast engineers. And it may be possible that some of these partner organizations may serve as a vehicle for people coming from other countries to help fill the void in the United States for broadcast engineers. Good point. I think there there is a void and the void will only get bigger. Uh, but yeah, bringing people from, from other countries where uh, I, I, I go to other countries and I find generally a bit more enthusiasm for radio broadcasting than I find in the U.S. That's not everywhere. It's not a broad brush paint job, but uh, I do find a lot of enthusiasm in other countries for radio. The other Sometimes thing I, feel like I notice is, is I find there's a lot more degreed electrical engineers holding jobs as broadcast engineers than there is in the United States. Ah, uh, good point. Good point. All right. Cool. Uh, Chuck, we've got something coming up right after this break. Uh, it is yep. called skinning. What? The cat? Cat, cat skinning. Cat skinning. All right. That's it. Hang on. You're going to you're going to learn from this if you're watching or listening, doesn't matter. This is a, it's a good audio thing. So hang on for that. I want to uh, introduce you to a new product uh, that is being distributed by Broadcasters General Store and it's from Hank Landsberg at Henry Engineering. Let's have a look at uh, at, at this this product. Um, this is the brand new thing called the Sportscaster. It's a sports broadcast audio control system. And this one rack unit box, you take this to your sports remote, and what you can do with it is pretty darn amazing. Let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, at the signal flow here. Uh, the Sportscaster is a box that lets you fully control a either a simple or a complex 
or anything in between sports remote broadcast from a remote location. So, uh, you, you know, Henry Engineering for a while has had uh, these, uh, th these, these boxes um, that you can control. Uh, it's the, the talent intercom mic facility uh, uh, so that you can hear, you can have a cough button, you can talk back and forth. Uh, they're called sports pods. And you connect sports pods to this sportscaster box from Henry Engineering. And here are the, some of the things that you can do while, while you take a, take a look at the signal flows there. You have, of course, talent mic audio mixing. You have talent headphone audio distribution. You have talkback and intercom mic facility for the producer. You have duplex intercom between the producer and the talent. There's also producer headphone audio mixing. So the producer uh, of the show, and ma that may be one of the talent people, or it may be a, a separate producer there on site. Uh, that person gets their own headphone audio mixing. Plus, there's a headphone mix for the field reporter and for camera operators, if you're also doing video, as so many radio stations now are getting into this. Uh, you also have a field reporter headphone output and a duplex intercom between the producer and the field reporter. You get the idea? It's full of features here that let you produce a sports remote really professionally at a very low price. Uh, party line intercom between the producer, the talent, and the field reporters. They can all have a talk around. The camera operators get their own headphone output. There's talk back from the producer to the camera operators. There's also inputs for a crowd mic, a PA announcer mic, right, for your high school or college uh, football, basketball, baseball. You also have a cue bus to audition auxiliary sources. So let's say you've got your iPod or your iPhone. You've done a, an interview. You want to cue it up to the right place. You've got a cue bus for that. And there's a main program output, of course, uh, to go to air, to go to streaming, to go to, to your remote, uh, what, a Marty or whatever your, your functionality is for getting that audio back to the studio. All these functions are provided by Sportscaster using really intuitive controls. They're easy to understand, easy to use. And by integrating all these audio functions in one unit, Sportscaster eliminates the need for multiple mixers, headphone amplifiers, DAs, power supplies, and complicated wiring. The Sportscaster can be installed in minutes using standard cabling. It's a one RU box that mounts in any standard 19 inch enclosure. Really and a great idea. And you, you know the, the toughest thing to, for, to design this? Hank Landsberg had to really understand what broadcasters, especially radio broadcasters, need in the field and then draw out everything that had to happen for a successful broadcast and then turn that into high quality circuitry in an easy to use box with controls that make sense. It's just amazing. It's about time that somebody produced this piece of equipment and Hank Landsberg has from Henry Engineering, the Sportscaster. It'll be available in mid-July. They're taking pre-orders right now at Broadcasters General Store and the price, it's under $1,300 list price. I hope I have that right. I think I, I think that's what I read. Under $1,300. Yeah, it's $1,295. Begin shipping in July list price of $12.95. Call Broadcasters General Store uh, to, to get your price. Their website, by the way, at Broadcasters General Store is bgs.cc, bgs.cc. And you can, of course, give them a call at Broadcasters General Store. And I was just, ah, where did I do with the number here? Oh, man, I just, I just had it. And uh, where, where did it go? Where did it go? Uh, let's see here. Uh, and, uh, while I'm looking that up, I have used Broadcast General Store for years. They do an amazing job of taking your order quickly, of suggesting alternatives if you're not sure about what you want. They really know the whole line of equipment that they have. If they don't know something, they absolutely will find it out and get, get back to you on that. Uh, they're just amazing from that point of view. I guess the point there is, is customer service. Uh, their, their customer service is just terrific. And that's why I've been dealing with them for years and years. Um, so... Uh, I, I can't say enough good things about them. Also, or order tracking. Hey, two of my boxes came in. I'm looking for the third box that I ordered. Well, no problem. They uh, will track it down for you. They're just really good about this kind of follow-up that keeps you in the know. Uh, you want to give them a call. Their number is 352-622-7700. That's 352-622-7700 at Broadcasters General Store. Check it out. The Sportscaster from Henry Engineering. It's about time somebody did it, and Hank Landsberg did. So it's going to make a lot of happy broadcasters come this fall when you fully implement this thing into your high school and college football broadcasts and then later on for your basketball and, and uh, baseball remotes after that. Thanks a lot, BGS.
BGS.cc for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. All right, Chuck. I'm eager to hear this uh, editorial that you wrote some years ago. Okay. So applicable for today. Take it away. I wrote it after I heard this story from a guy you probably know, John Innes. Uh, John was one of the best broadcast engineers I ever met in my entire life from Sydney, Australia. And John's yes, passed yes. away, unfortunately, now. But um, yeah. uh, he told me this story. Back in the early 90s, I wrote this editorial back when I was SBE president in 1994, some 24 years ago. Anyway, it goes like this. The story goes that a young student was taking a test in physics. One question required him to explain how a barometer could be used to calculate the height of a building and to show all the equations he used. His answer was to climb to the roof of the building, drop the barometer to the ground below, and calculate the height by measuring the time and using the formula for acceleration. When the student learned he'd been marked wrong for the question, he protested. And because his answer wasn't wrong per se, but just simply because it wasn't the answer the professor was seeking, he was allowed 15 minutes to write the correct answer. When the 15 minutes was over and nothing had been written, the professor said, I guess you just don't know the answer, do you? And the student said, actually, I'm just trying to, trying to decide which correct answer is best. The professor asked what answers he was considering. And the student explained that one way was to attach a string to the barometer, lower it from the roof to the ground, and then measure the string. Alternatively, he explained you could start at the front door of the building, marking a line at the top of the barometer, then proceed up the stairs, counting the height of the building in barometer units. Then again, you could wait for a sunny day, measure the length of the building shadow and the length of the barometer shadow, and calculate the height very easily. But the student concluded probably the best answer is to find the janitor, tell him I've got this very nice barometer, and if you'll tell me the height of the building, I'll give it to you. The student got credit for the question, even though he was, stu uh, even though he was stubborn enough not to give the answer the professor wanted. And this is the editorial part. We as broadcast engineers have many responsibilities and duties in our stations, many of which are routine and even mundane. The only way we can differentiate our work from that of a robot, and incidentally to grow in our careers, is to utilize creativity and inspiration in everything we do. Perhaps there's better ways to do the things we do which are more efficient, less costly, less risky, or take less time. Daring not to take the easy road of that's the way we've always done it will pay off in increased effectiveness as well as job satisfaction. It has been said that the most dangerous situation is the man with a problem who only knows one solution. Wow. Let that sink in. And it's just I, I as appropriate thinking. today as it was back then. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, that, 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 oh, that's such a, such a great thing. I, I love it. I love it when you, <laughs> the last answer, has to find the janitor. <laughs> yep. Hey, tell me how tall this building yep. is. And I'll give you this nice barometer. <laughs> <laughs> That's thinking out of the box. Uh, you, you know, Chuck. Actually, I years ago, uh, I back about the time we met, I had an employee who taught me so much about this kind of thinking because so often he would, uh, I was you know delving into doing something the, the, the one and only way that I knew how to do it, and he would usually grab my shoulder, he'd back me up, and he'd say, "Kirk, let's just think about this from a bigger scale. For what exactly are we trying to get done here?" Yep. And he would ask that question, and I would have to answer, well, okay, here's what we're trying to get done, all right? Is there any other way to get it done than what we're doing? <laughs> and and he, his, and I would I would usually describe, you know, the, the one way that I knew to do it. And his usual, usual answer, because my way involved a lot of work. And his, mm -hmm. usually answer, his answer was usually started out with the phrase, screw a lot of work. We're going to do it. How about this way? Or how about this way? That's how right. about this way? That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's so yep. awesome. Thanks, thanks for helping yep. us think about that. I appreciate it. My, my pleasure. Uh, Chuck Kelly, uh, when when will we see you again? On on what stage? Uh, at what show? Uh, how would we? Uh, get are you going to broad with, uh, with you? Are you going broadcast Asia? Sadly, no. I've got other stuff oh, to do, no. so I won't be at broadcast Asia. But I will be at uh, at IBC. Bummer. I'll see you there. Okay, and, and maybe we'll someplace else that. sooner than that. <laughs> and I'm I'm excited about installing the Nautil. Well, actually, a, a guy named Don Muscle. You may know of Don. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to yep. be installing uh, this uh, Nautel uh, kilowatt transmitter uh, here mm -hmm. in uh, in on Kauai for us. Uh, hopefully, in a few days. Excellent. 
Very good. Looking forward to it. Enjoy. All right. Thank you very much, Chuck Kelly. Chuck Kelly uh, with Nautel, makers of uh, terrific uh, AM and FM transmitters. And uh, like I said, got one just right over there. Our show this week in Radio Tech has been brought to you in part by our friends at Lavo at lavo.com slash twerk. That's L-A-W-O, lavo.com slash twerk. Also by Omnia Audio and the Omnia Volt. Go to telosalliance.com and look for the Omnia Volt, an amazing audio processor for under $3,500. And also brought to you by the new Henry Engineering Sportscaster. Now you, you match this up with the sports pods and you have got a complete intercom and sports production system for terrific sounding remotes. You will be at the top of your game. You'll sound just like all the big boys uh, with this setup. It's just a, an amazing idea. Thanks to Hank Landsberg and Broadcasters General Store where you can get your quote uh, on it. It's only $1,295. Start shipping in July. Thanks a lot to Suncast, our producer, and to Andrew Zarian, uh, the founder of the GFQ Network. Hopefully Chris Tobin will be back with us next week. And we'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.